Hello, good evening. Um, it's so great to see you all here. Thank you so much for coming. I apologize for the late start, but I said, if there's not soon come somewhere in the title, then it means we're not really at an event with some Caribbean writers. So hopefully you have some patience around that. Um, so I wanted to start, could you pass me that piece of paper? Um, by maybe offering you some of the official information about who Marlon and Unya are, and then talking a little bit about how I know um, both of them. Um, so I'll go through the official bios, and then I'll say some other things. So born in Kingston, Jamaica, Marlon James joined the English department of McAllister College in 2007. His second novel, The Book of Night Women, won the 2010 Dayton Literary Peace Prize and the Minnesota Book Award. It was also a finalist for the 2010 National Book Critics Circle Award in Fiction and an NWACP Image Award. His first novel, John Crow's Devil, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize and the Commonwealth Writers Prize and was a New York Times Editor's Choice. He graduated from the University of the West Indies in 91 with a degree in language and literature and from Wilkes University in 2006 with a master's in creative writing. He's published a lot of short fiction, but most excitingly, his third novel, A Brief History of Seven Killings, is due out this fall. It's being called a buzz book, and here's a quote from Library Journal about brief history. This third novel should be the charm that makes him a household name, partly because of the arresting subject. You'll meet musicians and journalists, assassins and drug dealers, and even ghosts in what promises to be a wild ride. Clearly, the ghost talk <laughs> sent somebody out of the room. <laughs> um, and we're so pleased that Marlon's actually going to read from his, um, this new novel tonight. Unya Kempadu is a novelist and social development researcher born in England of Guyanese parents. She's worked and lived in various Caribbean islands and has resided in Grenada for the last 15 years. Her first novel, Buxton Spice, was published in 1998. It was long listed for the Orange Prize and translated into six languages. Her second novel, Tide, Run Tide Running, was named for the Casa de las Americas 2002 prize, and was well received on both sides of the Atlantic. Kempadu was named a great talent for the 21st century by the Orange Prize ju judges, and both books were nominated for the International Impact Dublin Literary Awards. So um, I actually met Unya in 2011 when she was in Iowa for the International Writers Program. And most excitingly, her new novel, All Decent Animals, was published by FSG in May 2013. So Unya is actually going to read from that novel tonight, which I'm really excited about. Here's what Christopher Shade at the New Orleans, Re Orleans Review had to say about Kempadu's most recent novel. In Kempadu's style of writing, the text is a sensory experience. Textures, fabrics, costumes, drum rhythms, colors of all vibrancies, tastes, heat, samba, sweat, sex. Often the text has an electric dialect of Trinidad, along with mesmerizing comparative language pull from the locale. For Kempadu, there was much emphasis on place in her characters. So that's the official story of who Marlon and Unya are. Um, but I guess I wanted to say a little bit about how I met both of them. I met um, Unya and Marlon first both through the pages of their books. Um, in 2001, I was just home from studying abroad in Ghana, and I had been listening to Pigeon for months and unsuccessfully trying to learn it. And I actually came across your book, Tide Running, in my parents' basement. I was recovering from typhoid fever and kind of um, really inundated with the sounds of Pigeon and so glad to kind of come home to the Patois and the book Tide Running. I feel like I read it um, in a feverish couple of days, and I was just so excited to be introduced to your work. Um, and in 2011, I was a uh, first year at the Iowa Writers Workshop. I met Unya at the International Writers Program. I guess some context, I would, had live, been living in Flatbush or the West Indian section of Brooklyn for many years. And so the transition to Iowa was not a smooth one. Um, so seeing Unya there was kind of like seeing a life raft. <laughs> um, and it was so great to be friendly with her, having already known her through her work. And I met Marlon actually for the first time that fall, he doesn't remember this, and maybe I won't say I met him, but I actually accosted him. Um, I was a total fangirl. Um, I saw him at the Brooklyn Book Festival, and I think I like may have mowed you down and said, oh my god, Book of Night Women was amazing. Um, so I've since recovered, and he um, respects me enough to have yeah, yeah. accepted this invitation. Um, but I'm such a fan of John Crow's Devil, which I read um, for a different way of writing about small 
Caribbean community. I took copious notes um, when I was writing my first novel actually on that book. And I wrote my MFA exam about the Book of Night Women, if you can believe that. Yep. Um, so I was wanted to invite these guys because I felt like they were at similar stages in their career and had really answered some of the same questions that I was thinking about. Like, can you do that in writing? That was kind of the question that kept coming up every time I started reading their books. Can you write an entire novel in Patois? Can you write a funny novel about slavery? These are the big questions that I think that their books answer, and I think the answer is hell yes, you can. And their courage to write these brave, beautiful books has blazed a literary trail for me and the next generation of Caribbean writers coming up behind them. So I'm really excited to have Marlon Unya here tonight. The format is they're gonna read each for about 15 minutes from their books. I have a whole list of prepared questions. Since we're an intimate group, I'm not gonna do that thing where they say, we'll leave time for question and answers and it's only five minutes. I'm actually gonna leave like a meaty 20 to 30 minute um, time so that we can really have a conversation with each other. So thank you for coming and I'll turn it over to Marlon first. Guys, thanks for, thanks for coming out and thanks for having us. This is really, really exciting. The last time I was in Philly, it was um, for a job interview at a place that I actually now work at. Um, it's funny because at first I didn't get the job. And then they had a crisis and they go, would you come and work for a year? I'm like, sure, I'll come. And one year turned into seven. So Philly can take credit for that. Um, I'm going to read from two, see two scenes from the novel that I have coming out. The very, um, very, very brief description of Brief History of Seven Killings is it's about of um, it's a huge cast of characters, both um, from Jamaica and all over the world. And the one thing they all have in common is that they are all within the vicinity of Hope Road when Bob Marley gets shot. And um, some are just people who are in the wrong place at the wrong time. Some of the characters are the people. Who, one of the characters is the person who actually shot him in the chest. Um, uh, in, in you know. At that time, in December 1976, was really crazy. Um, Roberta Flack, Mick Jagger, Keith Richards were all in Jamaica. But so was Carlos the Jackal and nearly all of the CIA's Latin America and African people. So when I hear people from, you know, from the Congo talk about Larry Devlin, I'm like, yeah, I know who that is. I know all the CIA people. So it was this really weird time. Something was bound to explode in December 1976 and end up being an assassination attempt. What I'm going to read actually has nothing to do with the assassination attempt. Um, in this section, these, are, these two characters are Jamaicans living in New York. And I'm glad we're talking about language, because these are two Jamaicans from two totally different type of social, um, st social classes, if you rather. So their Jamaican, are totally, Jamaican accents are totally different. Um, the first one I'm reading from is a character, her name is Dorcas Palmer, which is a very Jamaican name. Me. And um, in this scene, all you need to know about this scene is that there's a man in her bathroom who thinks she's going to kill him. And he's going crazy, and she doesn't know what to do about it. I'm not going to tell you how the man got in her bathroom. She starts, I don't know. Oh, and this is set in 1980, 1985, by the way. I see the glazed look. Some of you weren't even born. <laughs> so... That means half of the jokes they won't get. Anyway, so Dorcas Palmer. I don't know, but I'm coming damn close to the conclusion that Hedda Locklear's hair looks better in T.J. Hooker than it does in Dynasty. Or maybe I just don't like that the one woman in Dynasty who has to struggle for everything is the bitch. And not even a real bitch like Alexis Carrington, since she doesn't have any money, so she's just a bitchlet. This is why I hear just don't blood clot work on that show. Besides, she bet me really want to wear a uniform when she's on TJ Hooker. Maybe become a policewoman for real because trying to wear at attractive clothes all day is just too damn expensive, even when you're not trying to look good. Sometimes you just want a shirt that still makes men know that you have breasts. He's still in the bathroom. It's weird how I've been, I've been calling him he for the past, what now, 55 minutes? I mean, I don't know who the hell is in my bathroom. The thing is, the more I try to figure it out, the less sense it makes. So the best thing to do is just not think, really. Like that man in Crime and Punishment, where Dostoevsky says he was beyond thought or something like that. 
I swear to God, I wish I was still a book reading woman, lost on a bus somewhere in the city. At some point, it just turned into effort like I was trying, which wasn't a problem really until I started to wonder what exactly was I trying to do. I guess everything needs a goal after all. I don't know what the RAS I'm talking about. Anyway, this man is still in my bathroom like this is a shining and me out here like about to get on like Jack Nicholson. All this time, I'm trying to figure out what health problems such a strapping man could have. And it never occurred to me even once that clearly his problem was not physical. It's amazing how I just have a nose for tribulation, I swear to God. At least, if he's locking himself in the bathroom, he's not about to turn into an axe murderer. From the look of things, I'm the axe murderer in this story. I mean, this just doesn't make no sense. No, that will lead to thinking again. How about this? There is a man inside my bathroom that needs to come out. I can't get him out, so his family is coming to get him. Now I can get some peace from just concentrating on the facts of the situation. I like how that just reduces everything into something I need to care about. I like reduction, boiling down, editing out, leaving behind. Enough with the metaphors now for just cutting unnecessary shit from my life. All right now, all the unnecessary shit is locked away in the bathroom. Two sounds that I know, window sliding up and back down. But there's a grill to keep people out. Plus we're five floors up, which I guess he didn't remember. He's trying to make an escape. How long before he works up some courage to kick down the door and fight? Would he see that it was a woman in the house all alone or le and leave? Try to beat me up? I don't know about these ex-soldiers, you know. Everybody in the city look like any minute they might fall apart. You know what? You know what? I'm just going to stay, sit on this couch, straighten out my red velvet covering on the arm, and watch the end of TJ Hooker. I'm going to sit here and wait until his son or whoever shows up, although given that they call three times to get the address right, who knows when that will be. Maybe I should ask if he needs anything. That's what people always ask on these TV shows. I'm certainly not going to ask if he wants to talk about it. Maybe I should clean up my apartment since people coming over. Sure, that they're coming to check the place. They won't even notice that the bathroom rug that they're they won't even notice the bathroom rug that their daddy is sitting on. Maybe he's sitting on the toilet. Maybe by the edge of the tub. I don't know. What is he doing in there? Jesus Christ, he was so normal only a few hours ago. So normal and nice, and those words that men are just nor that men are just not worth using on anymore. Dashing, debonair, something else that it begins with D. I mean, he was almost, I mean, I didn't think everything to not think that way since thinking about men never ends well. And here it is, thinking things didn't end well anyway. Lesbians must be the most satisfied people on the planet. Maybe I should go over to the door and tell him again that his son is coming, except fuck you, whoever you are, wasn't very funny the first time I heard it, and it won't be any funnier the second time. So, so that's Dorcas. Um, a lot of quick scene. This character, his name is Weeper, and he's um, he's a gunman, and um, he took the, the the head of Jamaica's crime syndicate. His name is Josie Wales. Comes is who almost single-handedly brings uh, introduces New York to crack. So he's now in in. Um, Brooklyn to survey his handiwork, his kingdom of crack, and promptly gets robbed by a crack addict. So the crack addict holds him up at gunpoint. Um, nobody sees Josie Wales literally SHIT himself, and okay, figuratively. And the person holds him at gunpoint, and when he hands over everything, the person fires. Except it's a water pistol, and it's piss. So Josie is not happy at this moment. So before this chapter begins, um, Weeper, who is Josie's second in command and another second in command, both show up and Josie takes the guns from both of them and head to the crack house. Two guns, one in each hand like an outlaw for real. No voice, no sound, no nothing but the step in. Josie Wales stomps slow into the dark to the crack house. He hears the two of you following and turn around and stop and look. We stop, wait till he start walking, but you be stand still and I follow. Josie walk quick and hunch him shoulders like a beast. I want to ask you be what happened, but keep walking. Breeze blowing the smell of piss off him shirt and into my nose. 
He stepped right past the man on the step and go through the door. Candles all along the floor, making the house look like church. Candles making slow lights, not like Josie, moving fast. Plenty beer can on the floor. On, on, the all can, sorry, on the wall, candlelight making the graffiti jump. A big K and a big S on the right, peeling paint on the left. In the middle, another doorway that Josie already stepped through. He lift the gun on him right and a sudden flash of fire. He kick away a whiskey bottle and me right behind him, following him. On the right, a man lay flat, a man lying flat and in blood creeping out. Bathroom on the right. White man or a Latino man, straight here man on the toilet with him pants down. Maybe he taking a shit, but he slapping his left arm for the vein to pop. Josie lift the Glock and pop off too. Second bullet lift the man off the toilet and he crash on the floor. He passed the next open door on the right. Flashlight taped to the cupboard. This must be the kitchen. Flashlight shining down on the man on him knees like him praying. Conroe here, face looking up but eye closed. One little red light where the crack pipe burning. And pop, 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 gunshot. Never sound like a pow in the movies. Always a pop, pop, pop. Still Josie moving. And the house don't wake up yet. Each step are crunched through beer can and coke can and pizza box and Chinese takeout and 40 ounce bottle and dry shit. And he's still stamping as he pass another, another doorway with a man lean up slight in the hinge, but his back still to it. And around him waist, two black hands pulling belt and the button. Her baby holding onto her back and sucking a pacifier while she sucking the cock. Josie pop him and he slump back on the door. But she's still standing up and she's still sucking the cock hard and take it out her mouth and slap it over and over because he gone soft. And if he don't come, he not going to pay her. Josie walk off and me walk off, leaving her putting the cock back in her mouth. We walk into the living room. Who you looking for, I think, to say, but don't. And on the right, a black woman in a right brazier, left strap hanging off, smoking. Man behind her with no shirt on, only white shorts, or maybe a black shirt since there's not enough light. But him cigarette burning at the tip and pop, 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 and the man slumped back in the couch. The black woman turned behind and look, then look at me. Then she turned behind again and look and scream. That do it. One scream lead to another scream. And in the candle flashlight, a white woman scream but drop her syringe. And she dive to the floor but land face first. And the needle stuck right through her bottom lip. But she fling garbage left and right, still looking for it. And people all around her coming out of the dark and limping and hopping and crawling and running now. And Josie lift both guns up and let all hell loose. And people running and tripping and falling. And one man runs straight to Josie but him right high explode. And he fall fat like a tree. And a woman run and jump through the window at the back but with one floor up. And make sure she scream all the way down. And I hope she didn't land head first. And a man in a baseball cap and a plaid shirt with a 40 ounce in a brown paper bag come out of the room to say, what the fuck? And get two shot in the chest. And the bottle fall and shatter. And in the room be two. A boy with curly hair and a woman with a tam on just about to suck in the first whiff of the crack pipe when a slug burst through her forehead and the pipe drop. Motherfucker, you dropped the motherfucking pipe. You dropped the motherfucking pipe. The curly hair boy say. But Josie moving on and the house clearing out. And I want to grab him and say, what the fuck you doing? But Josie gone dark. And he take the stairs and staying on the left side like he in the dark. Like in the dark, some steps break off. And I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to come right up to the top of the stairs. And he fire the two guns same time. And the man fall over the railing and a woman grab her pitney And run to the small room and slam the door. Just in time for Josie to bust three shot in the door. He kick off a doorknob and walk in the room. And a big black man on a mattress on the floor fucking a girl hard. And pap, 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 and the man slumped down on top of the woman who have to shake her head out of the crack is before she start to scream. A man run past the door and Josie run out and shout, pussy all. He run out the door and fire at the man with the right gun then the left and catch him in the neck near the ear, then right in the shoulder and left in the back and right in the back and left in the neck. And he dropped to the knee and the left, and the left gun blasts a chunk off the top of his head. He's still pulling the trigger to a click, click, click. Josie, I say. And he swing around and point the gun at my head and click. He stand there with a the gun to my head and me stand there looking and me stiffen my back and blow up my breath and tighten my stomach. 
Give me your other gun, he say. He go over to the man, roll him over, and take money out of the man's pocket. Then he walk back in the bedroom with the girl whimpering under the man dead weight because he was a big, big man and shoot him again in the head. Then Josie go downstairs and turn into the room and fire one shot and walk out. I'm a looking and the boy rubbing the woman pregnant belly and crying. Josie passed the man with a bleeding eye and one, two, pop, pop in the head. And we passed the white woman in the living room with a syringe still stuck in her lip. Still on all fours, scraping through shit, looking for her syringe. And we pass the bedroom, and the woman in the right brazier gone, but the man in the, the band with a cigarette still smoking, and Josie pump on him in head. And we pass the last door, and the man still leaning against it, and the woman still sucking the cock, and the baby still holding on to her sweater, and she's still pulling it out, saying, get hard, baby, just get hard. And she's still sucking, and we pass her, and we pass the man in the corner here, and he's still breathing short and gargling through his blood. Sorry. Josie put the gun right up to him forehead and fire. Then he walk off and pop one into the white Latino man. And we finally near the doorway. And he forget the last man who was shooting up right beside the body of the man. I pause for a long time, then run through the door after him. The man on the steps, gone. I walk over to Josie and Josie swing around and point the gun at me again. He held the gun near my head for a long time, long enough for me to start count. Josie, Josie, is what is, brethren? Is what is? Then he don't even give the gun back to me. Just drop it on the ground and walk off. You be turned to walk off to, but then he stop, turn back round and look at me, but I can't see him face. Thank you. <laughs> That's no. all right. <laughs> wow, uh, the violence and the rhythm with it. Wow, <laughs> but uh, you know, after reading Book of Nights, women, it took mm. me a little while to to recover from that ah. too. But I'm looking forward to reading this one. It's quite sounds really, really amazing. Um, so, all decent animals set in in Trinidad. Um, writing it, it sort of became a struggle between uh, writing about Trinidad as a country because the country be became a character um, as opposed to the two main characters. So in this, um, but in writing it, and I chose two pieces that contrast the voices as well since we're gonna talk about voice. Um, Sammy, the taxi driver, sort of popped up halfway through while I was writing the novel and it instantly became a lot easier for me to write, and it was because of Sammy's voice and his personality. So I'm gonna read a couple of bits um, that show you Sammy's voice as a taxi driver, and then Atta is a sort of artist, um, and Fraser is the main character as well, who is an architect who is dying of HIV AIDS, and Atta and her um, European boyfriend, Pierre, end up looking after and caring for, Pierre, for Fraser as he dies. Sam was deep in Independence Square when he get the call. Lyman with full-time taxi drivers for a few, passing time before heading for a sweat on the savannah with the boys. Vigorous domino stirring up elbow grease and dribbles a cow heel soup on the metal table, good and proper. Sam just looking on. He liked to see everything and hear everything. It's his learning, he tells people. He would laugh and listen and join in with the talk sometimes because talk is cheap, even free in his taxi. But he's one man that love he Trinidad. And so when shit happening and he's seeing wrong things going down, he does get real, real aggravated. It does just get him rile, just rile. Then he have to find a way to cool himself and mind his own business. Sometimes he goes and he check his lovely girlfriend, look upon his lovely cool and sweet and smooth face. Or sometimes he take an extra sweat with the fellas. But this afternoon, nothing riling Sam. He was just listening and going for a regular football practice soon. Tiny Whiny was playing on the big old scratchy speakers by the door. 
And that was another reason why Sam liked to come by this corner bar. They like to play a lot of old time soca and calypso. He can rely on that. And it's mostly old fellas always there. Even though Sam is a young fella, he likes to be around older people because they have more learning and they see more plenty things. And they talk less shit shit about woman, woman, woman. Sam have all them old Kaiso tunes on the little cassettes and now on CDs too. But it's a different thing altogether when you hear them songs between old folks who appreciate them. Together with the rum jokes, sparring and double and tender and dom domino competition and such like. Sam watch them men laughing, stamping their foot together with the slamming, scattering hidden flies on the sticky floor. And he look at rosy round face shining down by the back behind the dark, dark bar. And he think, Trinidad's sweet boy, I love it. Yes, this is he, he say quick draw style when his phone ring. He had picked up that line from Fraser. Fraser handy for a good few lines. But Sam feel when he say it fast, fast so, it sound like business. He smile as Fraser say something, teasing him as usual. Then he tell the domino players he heading out to make a turn. He had parked quite over so by his friend's little car park. But he don't mind the walk. He walks quick anyway, just like how he talks. He likes pedestrianizing this part of town. That's right, pedestrianizing, footing it in the heart of Port of Spain as he sees it. It always have action and thing going on, making it feel like a real city to him. He likes to see them decent office girls at this hour going in and out of KFC on the corner, buying a little dinner pack to go. This is the working people hour and time to start making tracks home. Time to buy the few groceries you're missing from the Chinese shop or pick up repaired shoes from the leather vendors in the middle of the square. He passed them now packing up, crinkling big plastic huckster bags, stuffing them with their sandals and calabash ornaments, coconut pendants and all sorts of Trinidad souvenirs. By this evening, the smell of leather and incense will be gone from round these tight stalls. But for now, as he's stepping into the open boulevard, under the high, sparse, old pui, pui and flamboyant trees, the sun in too hot and the traffic flowing and the corn soup lady setting up, and he just get two extra turns to make for the day. Wine, Miss Tiny. Roll back, Miss Tiny. Sam pull up, scrunching in, the, scrunching the gravel in the courtyard, park the fateful Nissan Sunny, and hop out, head into Fraser glass door. She coming out already, though. Fraser kissing she cheeks just like how he kiss every damn woman. But like he give her flowers? Sam never see this one before at all, but she bust Sam a big smile and say thanks before she even get in the car. In the front seat, Sam smile too. He likes smiley people and better yet ladies, but he pride himself on never getting too fresh. Always know how to handle things right through. Uh-huh, where we heading? Your wish is my command and Fraser say you want me to pick up and drop somebody else later? The woman watch him like she's seeing a small brown rabbit instead of a man. She listen to Sam nasal voice and watch his squingy self and long cheerful face. Sam hands must be little paws mastering the steering wheel, the dashboard, the phone, and the tape deck. Two feet must be hind legs, stab stabbing quick at the clutch and accelerator. She watched the pizza boy's soft drink cup and half empty bag of granola between the seats, homey like. And she maybe notice his number plate is private, not hire car. She start explaining her address and right away Sam know it, nodding, ginching himself forward into the steering. So, so you's from where? You're not from here. I never see you around here before and I see a lot of people. You are feeling nice, you get flowers, that's nice. Sam thinks he might as well, like, he might as well make chats. This one look open to that. And she looking excitable. Right, right, you, you, know, Fraser, you know Fraser, I say that. Cause I know he a long time and I do a lot of run-ins for he. Errands now. You know, you could say I see office gopher. Not chauffeur, mind you. And I would notice if he had a nice lady like you be he here before. I don't forget people. That is just how I is. Since I'm small, I never forget a face. The woman at her introduced herself, surprising Sam for a second with a handshake move. But then he quickly accept and extend the paw, the one with the long little finger, fingernail. So Sam cut through the quiet back streets of Woodbrook. He know the one-way system, all the potholes and crossroad dips in the road, like he know all four white walls of the Laparouse Cemetery close by. 
So, so what time you want me to pick up this person? From where? Oh, right, I know the hotel. Yes, so he's a visitor, right. And where are bringing he to? Okay, okay, same place. That's easy, good. And that's nice. Uh, that's a nice time because I will finish my little football practice by then. It's perfect timing, fine. Sam see why the woman looking excitable now. He smile when she smile at him again. Something nice going to happen tonight. He knows so. And that's why he, she fidgeting so before she asked if he working late. Sam couldn't resist. It's a kind of date, no? The flowers. But I didn't want to be so forward as to say something, you know. Not everybody does appreciate a friendly comment. That's nice he give you flowers. Men don't do these kind of things enough again these days. Me, I was an old-fashioned kind of. Her mind in fast forward, trying to plan for a type of date she never had, bringing a man she didn't know at all into her home. Atta is thinking she could still suggest they go out to eat. She doesn't even bother to ask Sam about his football or keep up the chats. So we go to Fraser's house now, um, who's bringing Atta and her boyfriend, Pierre, to meet his parents in their home. In her own kitchen, Mrs. Goodman was overwhelmed by the piles of food she was preparing. She spotted Fraser parking outside, and, uh, parking outside the yard and hopped out to greet them. You reach, oh gosh, I thought you would never get here. How many times you do that to me, eh? Reaching out for Fraser's face. Look at you, what happened? Taking in his rumpled t-shirt and shorts. Fraser automatically smoothed his t-shirt, sucked in his belly and tried to straighten up for the Sunday formality she expected. She greeted Atta and Pierre perkily, glances darting at everything, Atta's white skirt, Pierre's long pants and clothes, shoes, their color and class, well suited, she thought, to, to Sunday lunch at her home in the green suburbs of Arima. Fraser had pointed out tour guide style, the well-kept houses with pretty flower gardens, and how this marked the neighborhood, neighborhood off from the roadside town and Carib capital of the island. It was a history he was proud of, in a different way to the middle class he mocked. Arima, a blend of all races, including the last Amerindians, with an old-fashioned emphasis on good, proper education, faith, and hard work. People like my father, agriculturalists from humble backgrounds, came to set up field stations and food processing plants. These people work, boy. In this case, with my mother's constant nagging and pushing, I don't know if it's, so, sorry, these people work, boy. They work their way up to cushy class and respectability. In this case, with my mother's constant nagging and pushing, I don't know if it's so cushy after all, huh? She was an easy boy, still isn't. I love her, but that woman can make you miserable. Mothers, the, Britain, the Brit in Pierre had sympathized. If only we could be born without them. <laughs> then Mrs. Goodman was ushering Pierre to the front door, harassing her husband to get out here. Mrs. Goodman had instantly decided that Pierre was the most important guest from the time he opened his mouth. The English accent did it. Upper class, she thought, with a touch of French. It thrilled her no end, and it was clear to Atta, as was Fraser's embarrassment. She practically twittered around Pierre to seat him to find out where he lived in Port of Spain. Mr. Goodman was quiet all the time, all the while. He didn't need to add much to his wife's chatter, it was, which was filling up the already cluttered living and dining room. Every surface was crammed with porcelain and glass ornaments. Carpets and rugs at different angles covered any stretch of floor. A cream synthetic one even lay under the dining table and chairs. Little plants and wind chimes hung on the ironwork that enclosed the little veranda at the end of the room. And out there, plant pots, pedestals with urns and hanging ferns crowded the few garden chairs. Mr. Goodman seemed at odds in his own house, even after living in it for 20 years. Something Mrs. Goodman still didn't seem to take into account. Atta had noticed Fraser's reaction, almost a wince, when he stepped in. Maybe it had gotten more cluttered. Maybe he never felt at home either. The lunch was good middle class Sunday best, with way too much food spread out like a feast for, for a dozen people. But they all made good with the occasion. They washed down as much of it as possible with one bottle of cheap rosé that Mrs. Goodman had flourished, then two good bottles of white that Pierre had brought. Fraser had reverted to the overly sensitive, tremulously unhappy small boy he claimed to have been in that house. 
bit his tongue a few times as the little signs of distrustful marriage slipped out every now and then from under the angled rugs. I had to help Mrs. Goodman put away the loads of leftover macaroni pie, stewed chicken, roast beef, kidney beans, rice, curry, duck, coleslaw. I know you like it, Mrs. Goodman exclaimed when Fraser get asked again why she had cooked so much and curry too. And you could take home some. I don't know what you eat in town. Alice came in and cooked anyway, you know me. The top it off trifle was more than great. By then, even Pierre drank the sickly sweet sherry served in little cut crystal glasses and matching decanter. They all did, to give the lunch a fitting end, as suggested by Mrs. Goodman. And in the warm afternoon, the stuffing took effect, stretching them out on the wicker chairs in Mackerel Snake Syndrome. Mr. Goodman reclined in his special chair, a chair for retirees with tired bones and arthritis the ones that old men sit and shrink slowly in until they die, a chair to age in for such a strong, early retired man. It seemed merely a pose, a gesture to his wife about settling into forever. He sat in it now, broad, red, and comfortable in his pose, half listening to Mrs. Goodman still tweeting fitfully, unaware that his own son had already told the secrets of his failed marriage to his guests. Food is love. Sammy, Sammy stay in the kitchen, waiting for the food to finish. The big aluminum rice pot, almost full to the brim with pilau. The trickiest part, when you have to keep, when you have to keep checking to make sure it's not sticking. But although a good me, a, many a good pilau must get a little burn at the bottom, some say that is the bestest part. Sam smell his fingernails, raw chicken and seasoning. His hair must be burnt sugar brown in flavor. Cooking and salt red butter sweat. is in your blood, his mother had tell him when he take, out, take over the pot and make it taste better, meltier. Ain't no shame for a boy neither. Cooking food is, just, is how I put clothes on your back and build this house. This self same house, Sammy loves. Loves it just how he loves his moms and daughter. Dooley love is different. Red bird pepper explosion. Hot, hot in his head and heart, heart, heating up blood and making him faster, finer, fantastical. Sometimes he does feel like he's flying with Dooley on a silky floor of black glass and carrying his skin. Yes, bird pepper, bird pepper love like a scarlet ibis in a swamp at sunset. Plentiful, fiery, and beautiful. Sammy rise, take up the long handle pot spoon, and force it down through the sticky rice. The open window by the stove suck out the cooking air. That was one good thing with this kitchen, always cool because it's at the back. Concrete attached onto the little wooden house and the breeze liked to lick through, it at op lick through as it opened to the yard. No sweaty baking box. From this kitchen, he and his mother feed a ton of people already. All kind of food. And the events they're cooking for getting more varied now. He, knowing he brighter than his mother, introduced entrepreneur skills to what she'd been doing for years, food vending. Now, they're catering. At first for the police and one or two government functions. Then now they get private and corporate functions. Some even have to hire neighbors and friends to help, sometimes. But the trick is to keep it simple. Never hang your hat where, you, where, never hang your, hat where your hand can't reach. As Sam heaved the wet rice, he watched his mother check in on the docks outside. She bent right over the little fence and picked up the water pan to refresh it. He heaved some more. How women able with this kind of heavy turning and lifting boy? Sam thinking that's why his queen and them vendor ladies so strong. Iron pot strength. Ladies does have to go through plenty more than man. Where they find the patients from, he don't know. Moms come through the door sniffing the air. When she do so, Sam knows, Sam knows she mean is good. She wipe her feet and start on a few wares, never stop cleaning or doing something with her hands. She pack away the plastic bowls, even though she knows Sammy would do that. He works nice and clean in the kitchen. He learned good from her. What that girl father saying now? She asked, back to back in the small space. He ain't saying nothing, and I can't ask nothing. Most times he can't even look upon me and like it getting wasserer and wasserer. Sam covered the pot and stepped back to his stool. 
since they've been having praise meeting by he house with a set of pundit and thing. Hmm. Mom didn't turn wrong from the sink. I know you love that girl, eh? But you're putting up your head for nothing. Sometimes the company a man keep. More like the baba she drinking, he drinking heavy too. Hmm. Dooley's silky hair and skin, warm as the smell of sticky rice, stay with Sam. Dooley, my Dooley. Chutney sweetness, sugar dumpling. It's only she's stupid father can't see that, treating her like she's a blight. The man's bad company watching her like she's poison. Dooley, my Dooley, my pepper love. Thank you. So thank you so much for that. I have to do my little um, mini Amazon.com promotional. Um, so there's some books for sale. The first one, Marlon read from Book of Night Women is on sale. These are bargain basement prices, $11. You can't beat this. Um, All Decent Animals is also on sale, which Unya just read from. And a chapbook of my short story set in Jamaica actually is also on sale for five bucks. So. On to the questions portion of the evening. Um, so I talk a lot about narrative voice in my classroom when I'm teaching um, introductory creative writing. And I wondered how you thought about voice um, as a way into your projects. So Unya, you talked about Sammy, finding Sammy's voice, opening up that book project for you. Um, Marlon, I would want to know in a similar way if there were any um, characters, like once you found their voice, it gave you an entry point to a particular storyline or to a book itself. So either one of you. <laughs> um, well, what should I say? Because um, Night Woman is a different thing. The, the, my problem with um, Brief History was just figuring out who, whose voice, who should tell the story. Mm -hmm. And um, I had a lot of false starts. The, the, the pages of false starts could be another novel. And um, it wasn't until I was having dinner with a friend of mine, and she she just said, "What if it's no one person's novel?" Mm -hmm. And then she asked, "When was the last time I read As I Lay Dying?" And um, and then it just clicked for me that it's it was a lot of voices. So um, I mean, the novel has one hundred and eighty nine characters, and around twenty of them <laughs> narrate <laughs> narrate. So yeah, it so it goes on for a while. But um, yeah, th as for but. The, but my point being that this is a novel that's uh, totally driven by a voice. They're mm -hmm. all first-person um, narratives. And that was, um, you know, I had to read um, Orhan Pamuk's My Name is Read a couple of times just to convince myself that I could do that. Because um, coming from Night Woman, Night Woman was a fight. The first draft of Night Woman was all standard Jane Austen English. And, um, and I stayed away from the voice for lots of reasons. Um, one being a sense of cultural inferiority. Mm -hmm. That patois is what you hear it's called, broken English, like it needs to be fit, repaired. Um, so the whole idea of telling a whole novel in patois, I was like, no, we can't do that. Um, I told one person at Jamaica, and they're like, aren't you an English teacher? We, you know, we, 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 <laughs> yeah, I was like, why, why I want to write a whole book in bad English? So that was a huge, that was a huge fight. I fought with the main character of this book the whole way, because um, it wasn't supposed to be about voice at all. Um, and writing about it, writing in voice, I had to come to the point where not only did I accept voice, but actually become to be proud of it and cherish it. Because um, I was coming from a point where that type of voice was something I didn't think had a place in, in serious literature. And even now, sometimes, there are different, and, and, and not necessarily unwarranted, there are times when I go to a reading, especially if they're, say, older Jamaicans, and as soon as I start the patwa, they think it's going to be slapstick comedy. And when they realize that I talk about people killing people in very violent ways, mm -hmm. it, it's almost as if I've let down the culture. Because even on both sides, there's still this expectation that if you're going to use this voice, you're going to do the, the Caribbean version of step in, fetch it. <laughs> so the whole idea of using that to tell a serious story was one of the things I pushed against when I was writing both books. And I had to kind of like get over, get over that crap, quite frankly. Um, a lot of that what came from, you know, discovering novels told in voice. A lot of them American novels, like um, The Color Purple, Huckleberry Finn, um, 
you know, even um, even even stuff like train spotting. Uh, just um, realizing that you know, in these cases, not every case certainly, but in these cases, the character was the best person to tell the story. So I just had to like shut up. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, um, for me, the, uh, my first two novels I wrote in first person, um, and having not really aspired to want to write before, um, it was a process of really trying to write how I think, and so it was naturally in Creole. Um, this, this novel, because it, this one not, was, was more of a challenge because it was an urban setting, and more sort of cosmopolitan characters. Um, so the voices for uh, the more international characters f was also how I speak and think too, but um, when I found Sammy's character and that connection with the sort of uh, um, the natural rhythms of the Trinidad dialect, the Trinidad language, it felt more comfortable. But um, yeah, no, I think coming from a sort of uh, an orthodox education home, I was home educated, and my parents were sort of a little ahead of their time, and they were heavily promoting um, Caribbean literature. This was in the 70s. So I grew up reading Selvan mm -hmm. and them saying, well, you know, this is our language and it can be printed. But Lowell's, uh, but the old, I mean, the, the early Caribbean writers still did write in, in, uh, standard English, but Selvan was my earliest influence in terms of how to use the language and keep the spelling, but change the sentence so it ca carries it. It gives you that mm -hmm. rhythm, mm -hmm. but it's still readable. Um, so it was really just uh, writing in third person was a challenge for me in this one, mm -hmm. um, having that, that sort of distance. but. I, yeah, the, expect, the, the, the whole issue that you were talking about of, of the expectations of what Creole language brings when it's in literature mm -hmm. and on the page is another story, is another struggle, which I understand and I'm against completely too <laughs> because it comes with all these sort of classes, mm -hmm. perspectives, you know? Yeah. So um, one of the questions I have, since you guys brought up this question of syntax, so you talked about changing the the word order so that it more matches what people actually speak like, but keeping the spelling kind of yeah, more like standard instance, English. It had was to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, you know that's not a standard English sentence, but right. it gives you that rhythm still, but the words mm -hmm. are spelled so that you can read them easily. Are there other ways? No, I do pretty read? much the same thing. Um, and sometimes I actually think the standard English, whatever that is, mm -hmm. um, sometimes actually works better. Like um, certainly in Night Woman, like to use a, a, a Jamaican word, blood clot, Mm -hmm. it's, which is a you know an expletive, but most Jamaicans spell it blood C L A A A T E mm -hmm. or A A A A A A A A A T E or whatever, <laughs> and we we spell it that way. But the thing is, if you put it back as blood cloth, then a different type of question comes up, like why are these women using female body function as a way to insult each other? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it raises these sort of troubling questions that we don't think about because we have now turned it into all these sort of phonetic spellings. But the whole idea that all, all these, these, this sort of female body function, female sexuality is bad, it's nasty. It, it, it creates a whole level, especially when women are saying it to each other, which wouldn't have happened had I spelled it the way we always spell it. So I do that as well. Where, um, because, you know, in Jamaica, we don't say can't, we say can't. You know, but if I write C Y A A H, everybody who, anybody who's not, in fact, a lot of Jamaicans will read and go, "What's a saya?" <laughs> Say, let's put can't. And you're right, because the, 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 the syntax and the way words are put together are just different. You know, we don't say the books; we said the book them. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, certain things we we do not pluralize. Some things we don't. You know, nobody. If I have th three books on here, I don't, I'm not going to say three books. I got a three book. Okay, I have yeah. another question to follow yeah. up on this. So now that you've created this um, structure for yourself, so you've decided blood clot is going to be spelled blood cloth, mm -hmm. did you find yourself struggling once you'd finished, this is a writer's question, to go back and make sure that everything was um, standard so that, for example, the rules that you had created for yourself mm -hmm. within the book um, made sense across? 
all yeah, of it? I was that you, a challenge? I think you have to because um, you can't assume the editor will know. Mm-hmm. Like one of the, the, the um, struggles I'm going to have with this book is um, sometimes they're so hands off, they think it's actually um, pato. And I go, no, the grammar is still wrong here. It's not, <laughs> it's not pato. We don't say that. Mm-hmm. Pato has a system. It's not a, this sort of organization of disorganized words mm-hmm. slammed together. So sometimes you have to tell them, no, that was that that actually was a mistake. That is a typo. Mm-hmm. Um, so you do have to go over and check because um, as 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 accessible as we make it, there is still a sort of um, disconnect with um, the editor. So you really do have to go in and do the work. Um, the, the 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 communication with the, the reader, if you want to call it that, is to a huge extent your work. I still have to see. I'm actually making corrections because <laughs> I was reading it up there. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and you, you do have to keep it consistent. But also, different people in, a, in Jamaica speak differently. One of the things about the book, this book is there are characters from all over society and their Jamaicans are all different. So the first character, um, Dorcas, almost sounds like, like what she is. She's been living in America too long. Uh, so her every now and then she will say you know Ras and Bomba so, but she also spent a long time talking about a woman's here doing TJ Hooker mm-hmm. uh, so there so paying attention to that becomes really 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 important so you guys both managed to write these novels entirely in Patois and get them published um, so I would love to hear um, so clearly it worked out on, on one level um, but I, w- I would love to hear what that process was like, for, particularly for you, Unya, because your books actually predate Marlins by about 10 years or so, the first one does. Um, so I, I want to hear something about what it was like trying to pitch the book, working with editors um, in this form that I imagine was a little unfamiliar to them. Well, it was unfamiliar to me, too, because it was my first book. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but... Uh, I was surprised myself because I expected the language to be a, a much more of a problem than it seemed to be. Um, and the advice from Caribbean writers that I shared it with and f- got feedback of was go to the Caribbean publishers. Mm-hmm. Don't, you know, don't, this is not going to go to international publishers. Um, but I approached it as a business project. And I did the research about how to get published in the U.S. form and the, the British system. The two handbooks are completely different. The U.S. handbook is this. This is the editor that you target. This is the person you approach. They are doing this genre. You look for specifics. This is how you do it exactly and your pitch and all of that. The English handbook is just the addresses of the agents and the publishing houses. <laughs> so I followed the American... Um, ad- commercial approach, um, because it is a business of getting your foot in the door and getting getting the product out there. and uh, But I still was very surprised by how it was received. And I think it was more to do with the coming of age story, the story being a, a coming of age adolescent story, um, and the, how I dealt with sex and sexuality in the book um, seemed fresh to them, uh, which was... So it was relieving to me, but um, I was surprised that the language was still not more of a, of a barrier. And there was very little editing done on the book. I think, too, the editor was quite embarrassed because she, <laughs> she was a Catholic <laughs> Scottish woman. And she would just like, start blushing. <laughs> <laughs> but very little editing was done on that, my first two novels. Um, and I think the same thing, too, where... Uh, because it's a language that only you know which bits are supposed to be Creole and which are standard mm-hmm. English, and it, it's difficult too for somebody to help you to edit that. So it relies a lot back on you paying attention and checking for the consistency and mm-hmm. the, the tone and the, the correct you know, usage of the words. Yeah. Um, but it's, I think the, the content and the stories at the end of the day is what transcends um, languages and that's what connects us to other literature from other parts of the world mm-hmm. yeah my, my story is pretty similar as well I was surprised that I didn't run into a lot of problems with my American editors um, not with this book or the novel the, the first one 
that never became an issue. In fact, um, my I was I was the one who was suggesting a glossary for that woman, mm -hmm. and my editor is the one who says the second you put a glossary is the second you exoticize the language mm -hmm. and make it think it's something sort of yeah, like it's almost you, you almost it's you're agreeing that it's a fetish. Yeah, and it's like no, they'll they'll get it. I was one who didn't think they would. The funny thing is, um, Riverhead is a division of Penguin, and Penguin USA um, bought the book. Penguin UK rejected it. Um, we had a very nice, long, passive-aggressive email discussion about it. <laughs> and she was the one who said, um, and I love, one of the things I love about UK editors is they love to, they never say UK, they say UK and the rest of the world. <laughs> so everything, well, you know, in UK and the rest of the world. <laughs> the Commonwealth? <laughs> not, yeah, I was like, you mean the Commonwealth? I was like, the, no. so, so she was like, um, would I consider rewriting the manuscript in Queen's English? so that it would appeal to the UK and the rest of the world. <laughs> um, and I just sent back an email. I was like, well, you know, no wonder Huckleberry Finn is an American novel. <laughs> and, and we had a, it's, it's funny, she, she ends up being the wife of somebody who I actually really admire. Um, but yeah, she, the, the, it was funny because the book started out in the same yeah. Queen's English. Mm -hmm. I was like, no, I'm not prepared to do that. If you know what I had to do to get to this get point with, yeah. with language. But she, you know, they, so I had a problem with with that publisher. Another British publisher um, picked it up and it became one of her biggest selling books. And if you think I'm the mature enough to not gloat, you misread <laughs> me. I gloat to that editor all the time. Uh, but yeah, there, there was this, this the idea that it was not universal enough that mm -hmm. th nobody would be able to understand the the whole I get it but they don't mm -hmm. just a sort of um I mean she'd be horrified by me accusing her of cultural superiority but that's exactly what it was and um and it was it was just really ironic because usually people assume that it would be the British publisher that's fine with Patwa and the Americans who don't get it except that uh, the idea there is still this idea that um dialect and it's a lot of his classism mm -hmm. um uh, urban welsh had the hell of a time getting train spotting published there are people who threatened to walk off the booker prize committee if they had made it a final choice they uh, threatened to walk because of a, a novel told in scottish dialect um but then again to their credit a lot of novels like london stani had to be retranslated again to come to america Whereas they were fine with it there. So it's, it's not necessarily that they're against all dialects. I think um, the Jamaican that they'd be used to would be something that came over in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, you know, I don't mean, yeah, if I was setting a novel in the 70s or so on, so on, but that is not the, the, the reality. The fact is, whether like it or, I like it or not, yeah, I grew up watching American TV and all that, and that's bound to influence it in some way. But also, I wasn't interested in this sort of nostalgic patois. Uh, unless I'm going to throw up on a dead body. But, <laughs> but yes, it was really interesting. Same thing, I was surprised. If you had told me before that it would be the Americans, the American publishers who had no problem and the British who rejected it, I wouldn't have believed you. Got it. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question and then you guys can ask questions. Um, so since we're at a university, I thought it might be useful. When I saw Unya, you talked about how um, sharing your novel in the Caribbean seemed to open up a space for Caribbean writers who never thought you could write like that before. Am I misquoting you? Yeah, I, a. <laughs> I, was from, I think we were talking about a workshop. Yeah. And yeah. A workshop and asking them to write without structure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of freed up. Yeah. So I kind of wanted to know, do you think that um, writing in Patchwa opens up some kind of distance, some blocks between like here and the heart space? Is there something that's opened up in writing in that form or is it just as difficult and just in a different way? I think it's just as difficult. I think um, regardless of whenever you're playing with voice, um, one of the things about um, the book I'm writing now is that it's the first time I have American characters. And not just American characters, but American characters in the 70s. So I get to the things like, that shit was motherfucking ace. <laughs> and crap like that, who nobody talks like that now. I always wanted to put spaz 
in a novel. So I watch lots of square pegs and freaks and geeks. Um, I think, I don't know if it, 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 I think it opens up in the sense that sometimes writing in, in, in your own data can in a way give you permission to be free with it. That, um, that it's, it's, because it's something that so many cultures and so many writers take for granted. I'm just gonna write the way I talk. I'm just gonna write the way I've learned. I'm just gonna write the way in which I'm comfortable communicating in every other aspect of my life. Why should I put on a cap to do this one? And I think that, yeah, it does give you that kind of um, freedom. But once you get the freedom and you get to the responsibility part, then it's as, yeah, it's as difficult as anything else. It's, um, you know, the, 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 the cha I don't think the challenges become any easier. It's the, the toolbox is freed up, but it's, it's, it's a pain in the ass to say anything else. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's even a little bit more difficult because you're dealing with a language that's not written, mm -hmm. and you are de defining, you know, new spellings or yeah. you know ways in which it's it's put down on the page and pushing those boundaries. So that you become aware of that responsibility when you're editing too. Um, after you've done the nice part of being able to write how you think, and then the, the thinking of audience and connecting and it, it, it becomes, I think, a little bit even more challenging and complex than if you were to stick to standard English. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and you know, I don't think about it much anymore, but I did when I wrote my first book and a lot when I wrote my second. Um, how will Jamaicans react to it? Um, how would, um, you know, how would the, 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 the speakers of the town react to it? And I get everything from this is not Patois to I don't spell pato that way, and so on. I was like, really? In your Oxford Dictionary of Pato, how do you spell it? And in your novel. Yeah. So, it, you, you, and I think you're gonna you're gonna run into that anyway because it's on, it's it's still for an ex, to a huge extent an oral language, mm -hmm. and I'm not and I and I have very mixed feelings about the whole idea of making it written language. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I. Yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm conflicted about it. I certainly can't dismiss the idea. There's some very, very solid reasons why we should do it. There are just as many solid reasons why we shouldn't. Um, you know, so it's, it's it, and those things, you know, you get bit more and more um, confident that in how you write, but it's always there. And I think it happens, anybody who's speaking whatever variant of English is, they hold the, the, the twin points of not letting down the speakers of the tongue to communicating. And, um, and this is one of those tricky things that I think um, we writers from Caribbean, this diaspora, speakers of pidgin, speakers of Creole, it's one of those things we have to play with all the time. After a while, you don't necessarily think about it all the time when you're writing, because then you'd never write. But it is one of those hats we're juggling. So, yes. This is to both both readers. I mean, uh, both authors. Um, so you're just talking about how you're trying to sort of codify or write this really spoken language. And I know, like authors like Zora Neale Hurston in *The Eyes Watching God*, chose to do a more like phonetic spelling of the words mm -hmm. that they chose and keep the the grammar, which made it hard for me, especially, to try to understand the novel, as I was not familiar with the dialect that they ch chose to write in. Do you feel that in choosing to keep certain structures, like the grammar or the syntax, but not um, the spelling, especially for such a language that is spoken and that you know, really relies a lot on the, the rhythm and the sound of it, do you think that something is lost for the reader in not having this phonetic spelling, especially for someone who is not you know, really uh, familiar with pidgin or patois. Um, I I yeah I think it depends on if the person if they're not familiar with it 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 can act as more of a block, um, and for those who here have heard it or are a little familiar then it it sort of um, opens another door. Uh, so it's really it's really. That's a difficult choice that you're facing when you're when you're editing and, and working it out. And at the end of the day, I sort of try to stick to what feels right for the character or that particular part of the story, um, and then let the readers figure it out or sort it out. Because you can't, you each person's understanding of of those rhythms. And sometimes, like the editor of this book, didn't 
no Trinidad really. It was the music, the the caiso and the old calypsos, that gave him a sort of sound attached to the to the rhythms of Trinidad language, um, and that was his connection. So it's I think it really varies according to the person's um, response to to the rhythm, mm -hmm. uh, which you have no control of as as a writer. I would say, too, like I, I made a recommendation to a couple non-Caribbean people of um, Book of Night Women, and they immediately put the book down after a couple pages because they're just like, I can't get into this. But mm -hmm. the audio book seemed to open up some space mm -hmm. um, for them to understand it because they'd hung out in New York for before and heard people um, speak Patois. And mm -hmm. so for them, it was kind of like hanging out on the block with mm -hmm. somebody who they knew, and it felt like that was an easier point of entry than trying to decipher the yeah, language and, on the page. And, I, and, and Night Woman is not written phonetically. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, something I think about, I, I think it really is an artistic choice. Um, I don't think it's necessarily more authentic because it's still, even if you spell it phonetically, it's still your, it, it's still phonetics according to your ear. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your phonetically may be a U, my phonetically may be double O. Um, so it's, it's but it, I, I think, um, Sometimes I think that's what the author is going for. Like, train spotting, I couldn't figure out until I started to read it aloud. And then I was <laughs> what, he was, what he was doing. It's like trying to read certain parts of Finnegan's Wake. I've now resorted to one page a month. Because <laughs> uh, there's no other way. So I think, I, I do think it's, a, I, I, think it, I think it can actually be an aesthetic choice. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a sign of, say, authenticity. Um, that said, Zora Neale Hurston got a lot of flack for that, particularly from black American writers. Richard Wright gave her hell for it. He was, it's the same thing that we get still at writing dialect. We'll have some of our older peers like, why are you writing in broken English? Why are you, you know, writing ghetto? Why are you whatever? And we still get, you know, this, it still get that. And I think part of it too is a sort of claiming it, um, claiming that even if you know the 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 almost you're writing a book where you're still saying oral the auditory quality of language is still superior and i think um it was almost a defiant choice on her part certainly based on the reactions she got from her peers but i don't think it's necessarily one is more authentic than the other because there is no again there's no rule book mm -hmm. no. there are lots of police but there is no, <laughs> no, rule book. no. no laws mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Go for yeah. it. Yeah. Um, thanks for reading. Uh, and I guess it's kind of a question about audience. Um, so f for Caribbean readers, you both deal with very difficult topics, I think. And you know, it's interesting what you were saying, Unya, about um, the coming of age story, sort of um, allowing the novel to transgress the, the language, whatever language difficulties there may have been with the US publisher. Because at the time, I think when that was published, actually that was a big sort of thing, people looking for uh, international coming of age stories in that way. But, but the sexuality of the coming of age story is things that we don't talk about in the Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. violence in Night Women and that you just read, mm -hmm. you know, the way that you, um, the way that you render it in such a complex, non-vindicationist way mm -hmm. is not how people are comfortable talking about it, I think. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, like how, how, um, how you see a difference, if you see a difference in the ways that the work is received when you read here and when you read, because when you read there. Um. Yeah, I think um, what's m I think maybe that I react to more uh, from the, the audience connection in the Caribbean as compared to a sort of European or US setting is the class differences in the reactions. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if I read a violent part, um, people who, because the, the, the access to literary circles or gatherings or festivals and, and, and tends to attract a, a, a sort of middle class and a, 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 a smaller po percentage of the population um, that has a sort of elitist type of, type of view, many of them. 
um, and that begins to sort of uh, disconnect from, from if you're reading from, from a working class perspective, there's a prejudice starting to appear there. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think I respond to that type of uh, response. Um, or I notice that more um, in the Caribbean than I do where in this setting it's more about the content or the language as voice. Um, and it's more, it seems more open without the class prejudice attached to it. Um, I guess, and that I think comes from um, reading in the, in the context of where that book is set and people knowing the culture and also having those same prejudices that what you know you don't talk you don't say those words about different body parts and talk about sex in this way or expose those things um, small island society also with, with a very conventional sort of uh, structure or, or communications um, compared to an intellectual sort of analysis and dissecting of the work too. It's very different experiences. Um, so I do enjoy both because for me it's important to see the reaction and how it's received in where it comes from. Um, but it's a little bit more um, problematic some, more, sometimes and uh, many people are very embarrassed by me I mean they just we just don't talk about <laughs> what you do because you, know? mm -hmm. <laughs> you expose our business you know? mm -hmm. um, so it's it's mixed but but I definitely would like more um, more of that interaction in the region uh, and this 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 type of uh, the feedback and the response here is rewarding because it's a sort of intellectual and intelligent sort of I'm not saying that there's no intelligent interaction in the Caribbean, but it's a more uh, sort of literary um, discourse and discussion mm -hmm. of the work, um, and also less connecting to you personally, because you know, so <laughs> like, oh, I know you, and you live there, and you know, they, you have fit into a certain class and category as a Caribbean person in the Caribbean too, mm -hmm. yeah, as a, as an author. Yeah. Um, in Jamaica, I've you know. I've, it's, again, it's um, across the board, and, and there are so many different things. One thing, one, two things I will I have noticed is I think I do get a more sort of um, appreciative, let's call it that, response from Jamaicans in the diaspora mm -hmm. um, than I do. The, the first time I ever had um, actual loud protests against a reading happened in Jamaica. And they just started shouting. They were like, there are children here, and blah, blah, blah. It was so <laughs> on. Yeah. Um, the first time I was kicked off a reading, I was, it was a Jamaican <laughs> event. <laughs> and um, they were trying, the, the thing is, they, 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 they were trying to be classy about it, ignoring the fact that my school paid for the event that they were kicking me off. I was like, that's really classy, because I'm pretty much paying you the check, but you're kicking me off your own program. Um, and they, they, they didn't deliver, they, they, I was, uh, it was me and Muta Baruka, um, a Jamaican poet, and they, they think I'm controversial. <laughs> but, um, but they basically sort of, first, like, we just wanted to ask questions. We're like, okay, fine, I'll just ask questions. Here's the list of questions. <laughs> so in, I think, in Jamaica, to, to quite a few audiences, and it, it does cut across class lines, I am an embarrassment. Um, I write nasty, vulgar things with nasty, vulgar women, and everybody's always killing people. And there is this idea we we now we call it brand Jamaica, and um, if what you're writing is not showing a positive view that lines up with a tourism commercial, you're kind of um, you're you're being anti-Jamaican. And um, so, you know, the last time I read at, a, at Calabash, there were editorials. They were like, if musicians are arrested for obscenity, why isn't Marlon James locked up? And, and so on. You know, but, that, that, but, you know, all that sort of paints as bad, you know, paints as superficial, I think, a one dimensional picture. Also, there is sometimes, I think, when, and it's funny because I, you know, when I was coming up as a writer, I, you know, some of the, read, one of the readings I went to at Calabash was Unia's reading. And one of the things that you, I, you know, one of the things being in the audience 
and hearing only I read her book and so on, I think it was Buxton Spicer is reading from, is that you just weren't aware that you could one tell stories this complex with deeply ambivalent characters and also that you'll ever hear that in a public forum that we could hear Jamaicans or even the Caribbean hear the really the, the stories. We love our slapstick, we love our comedy, but sometimes you want something where the answers aren't that simple. And um, to hear that sort of being unlocked can be a great thing for a Caribbean writer or a Caribbean artist or anybody. So I think that there is that when you read to an audience and when you, you are at a reading of a, a Jamaican or Caribbean person, just this sense of, we can go there, we can do this, we can talk about the things people keep pushing on on the rug, but there is still that sort of, why are you embarrassing us kind of thing. You know, I think you just accept it as part of, of what's going on. I mean, bring a bunch of Irish writers in here, you'll hear the same discussion. I, I hear it with a bunch of Croatian writers a couple of weeks ago. Edwidge Danticat has written a whole book about it about how she gets accosted by Haitians who think her characters are demeaning Haiti. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I thought my characters only owed an allegiance to themselves. So we, we, we you know, er, it's something you just, again, it's one of those things, if you're going to be the, the Caribbean writer, the aspirate writer, the writer who has to put on so many heads, you, it's just one of the things you're gonna deal with. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more question. <laughs> So <laughs> I was thinking particularly of the Book of Night Women, um, but I think you know, I can answer this question as well. What are some of the novels that you view your novels as being conversation with? I mean, I was thinking about Night Women because I'm very familiar with novels and narratives about American slavery, but I'm not as familiar with the literature of Jamaican or even Caribbean slavery. So I'm just wondering for both of you guys, what are some of the novels that you think of your work as in speaking to? <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I, 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 um, both this Night Woman and the book I'm writing now do sometimes explicitly reference other books. Um, Night Woman, I, I don't even try to hide it. I, I didn't want to come out of the shadow of White Sargasso Sea. So even the estate Calibra is clearly a Calibra in White Sargasso Sea. Um, that um, a lot of the novels of the 18th century were, were one of the things that why I, why Targasso see really appealed to me is the whole idea of the mad woman in the attic. Um, this idea of the, 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 the wanton mixed with Negro blood kind of Caribbean hussy who's out to destroy all the gentry. And this is where that came from, you know, from Jane Eyre and from that type of, from the, the, the whispered characters in Mansfield Park, and so on. So, um, so it was in some ways in, in, in conversation with that, but also I, I read tons of books when I'm write, writing. Um, and certainly for, for, for Night Woman, that um, which, um, Charles Johnson's Middle Passage, you're right, there weren't a lot of the books about Caribbean slavery, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write um, Night Woman. So a lot of books were about American slavery. Some of them weren't slavery novels like Color Purple. Well, Color Purple is crucial in terms of um, voice. Um, Song of Solomon. Um, I remember somebody asked me, do you think you'll ever get out of Tony Morrison's influence? I'm like, I don't want to get out of our influence. <laughs> I'm not leaving. Um, you know, with, with um, the one I just wrote, again, um, lots of books from, certainly um, James Elroy's American Tabloid, certainly a lot of crime fiction, actually. Um, crime fiction, hard boil fiction, stuff like James Elroy. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Characters in my books are always reading because I like to create that fictional universe where people actually read a lot. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I, I, you know, Carl McCarthy said that, that books come out of books. You know, I do believe that. I do think books sometimes are in in a kind of conversation. Um, I think with my first one, uh, definitely um, Naipaul's Miguel Street mm -hmm. and Anne Cannery Row at the same time I read them um, together and seeing uh, the characters in the village where I grew up being brought to life on the page and that, that form, that gave me the sort of structure, that was my first kind of 
and I kept going back to those two books with, with, my, with, with my first um, novel because it, was, it started off as a string of character sketches and, and events that happened in the village. Um, with, with Tide Running, less so, I think, um, because each book for me is, is, has been a different experience. And with Tide Running, it, it really felt more comfortable or still, I think, its true form should be film. So I connected with more sort of imagery like How Do They Come, mm -hmm. um, Buju Banton's music, um, contemporary music and, and, and music videos and uh, sort of, but not literature so much. Um, and, and with All Decent Animals, it's, again, I'm, I, I'm reading all the time, but I'm not really consciously sort of, I, I did, I used, um, Loss of Eldorado by Naipaul, um, a lot of research for this novel, um, and uh, Greek mythology as well as um, the, the the work that Carnival plays a big big part in this novel too. So um, more really for me, it's about connecting the writing with um, the sort of combination that makes up the Caribbean culture, which for me is music, visual imagery. Um, images, mm -hmm. moving image, um, and literature, but not just from the region. Um, so in terms of, of voice, like James mm -hmm. Kilman, Scottish writers, uh, mm -hmm. Urban Welsh also um, influence him. But Samuel Selvan as well, his, the way that he uses language has always been a constant kind of um, link back to, to, to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm so glad you brought up the film thing, because I'm always afraid to say it. It's like I'm usually more in influenced by film than by books. Yeah, so <laughs> I can see it connect yeah. to a film <laughs> easier than a book. Yeah. <laughs> Did you want to ask something? No, I was agreeing when you were reading, I was thinking Tarantino. Especially uh, had a lot of later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Same where my mind went. So I'm going to wrap up this portion of the evening. There's a reception, so you can stay for a drink and snacks, buy a book, they'll sign them. I may sign one if you buy one of mine. Um, Me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a small price. <laughs> a tip. A tip. Um, so thank you so much for coming. It's been lovely. Thank you.